It's a small ensemble, never any more really than a quintet, five pieces usually, somewhere between a trio and a quintet, so a small group. And uh, there's much more focus on improvisation in this style uh, than we have on uh, the swing era, for sure. Faster tempos, they purposely are trying to play tempos you can't dance to, either extremely fast or extremely slow. Because what happened was a lot of these musicians who wanted to be challenged and wanted to really push themselves, it wasn't happening if you were playing in Cab Calloway's band doing Minnie the Moocher every night. Because you were getting your eight bars of solo, and even then he was telling you, don't play that Chinese music. <laughs> if he started playing bebop, he called it Chinese music, and he actually kicked Dizzy Gillespie out of his band for playing the Chinese music. And, uh, and so you weren't, you know, you weren't allowed, the, the established swing era musicians didn't want to hear any of this, this youngsters playing this bebop stuff. So after hours, these guys would go to Harlem. There was a couple different clubs, Minton's and Clark Monroe's Uptown House, and they were basically formulating a music. This bebop is a music that's really created by musicians for musicians. It's not for the general public. They didn't really think at all about what you, the general public, were going to, how you were going to respond to the music. That was really not a concern for them. Uh, it was really, how can we challenge ourselves to play faster tunes, to play more complex tunes? And we want to weed out, they really wanted to thin the herd. They didn't want just every, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry picking up a saxophone, his trombone, his trumpet, and coming to the jam session and playing. So if you came to a bebop jam session, you had to be prepared. You had to gird your loins because you had to be fast and you had to be able to play in all sorts of different keys and you had to be able to do it on, you know, switch keys and stuff. And so there were a lot of players that played in the swing era that played in sections of trombone sections and trombone, trumpet sections and sax sections. They quit playing. There's a lot of people that just went into accounting or they went into retail. They just gave up. There was a guy named Dean Benedetti who quit playing and followed Charlie Parker around with a wire cylinder just so he could kind of record all of Charlie Parker's solos. And there's like a 10 CD set of only Charlie Parker's solos. So you have to, he cuts everybody else out, he kind of disses everybody else. It's just he starts when Parker would so, start soloing and stop it. So it's just like his excerpt, uh, just the solos that are just excerpts from all of his performances. So uh, the example I'm going to play for you is much later, it's like in the 1980s. There's not a lot of footage of Charlie Parker. I think there's only one thing, and I've got it on my YouTube site. But this is a really good example of bebop. This would be a good one that I could play for you as a listening example. Because with bebop, to use a modern texting terminology, there's a huge WTF factor going on. Where you're just kind of going, what? you just can't figure out, you can't sing a melody to yourself. You're, there's, it's just a whole bunch of information just coming at you. It's a straight no chaser type of music. It's a hundred proof. There's no concessions for you, the listener. So bebop is sort of the initial explosion. And then after our break here, I'm going to talk about the fallout, which would be cool, and all of the splintered styles that come out of cool, and hard bop, all of those styles. And they're much more listenable to the, the average listener, because they have melodies. They, they kind of started thinking about you, the audience, about, you know, we should probably think about how we're presenting this music. The bebop musicians, largely because uh, with Charlie Parker, he also had this drug problem. He usually would show up in the suit that he had slept in for the last two days and without his horn, which was in hock, because, you know, he had to get his fix. And so uh, there was a lot of unreliability, a lot of ad hoc things going on. These musicians never had the same people in their groups. It's returning sort of to a jam band thing again. It's like a garage band. These guys are playing off the top of their heads. Uh, they're not really arranging the tunes ahead of time. And it's largely improvised. Swing era was about 90% or more uh, written and only a very small percentage of what you hear is improvised. Now this example I'm going to play for you is a, from a concert that was a tribute to Charlie Parker. It's a eight, 1987 or something like that. 80, maybe 1990. And uh, it's a quintet, just like it says on your listening guide. Uh, let's see, we want to use that. So I'll wait for this to load up here. And the example I'm going to play for you starts right with uh, improvisation. Let's see. Let's see if I can get my menu here. Is it going to let me do menu? Oh, good, perfect. Okay. So, let's start with the trumpet player solo. So 
the stuff we talked about before. Oh, the stupid. Well, his hands are behind here. <laughs> you can see him a minute ago. There they are. Uh, he's co he's still comping. So he's playing chords like uh, Diana Krall did last week in the example I played for you. But you'll notice it's very punchy and kind of very short. It's, he's kind of trying to fit stuff in where he can in there. Uh, the bass player's walking, although we would probably more accurately call it a run, because it's the tempo is there. This is kind of medium up for a bebop player. This isn't actually as fast as they usually play. They can play faster than this. This is kind of, you know, it's really not that danceable. There were people that used to dance to this, but I think they were probably chemically enhanced. But uh, you're going to hear mostly solos. A long trumpet solo here. Listen to the drummer, too. This is Roy Haynes. He's still with us. Uh, Roy is, I think, 81 now, 82. And uh, he doesn't look much different than he does 20 years ago here in this video. I saw him in Boise a couple years ago at the Gene Harris Jazz Festival. And you'll hear these boom, crash, bam, boom. That's the dropping bomb. Sounds like little explosions. Roy's a great example. I mean, he's a living legend. He's played with everybody. Ella Fitzgerald, Lester Young, Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk, all of the living legends. I mean, he's a living legend, you know, literally. And still with us and still playing. There's Roy. Solo. Al this is an alto saxophone. This is by Frank Morgan. So this is the saxophone similar to the one that Charlie Parker played, the alto sax, which is in the female vocal range. Uh, Frank Morgan is an interesting character. He just died last year. He had a stroke at the age of 78. But uh, Frank disappeared for 25 years. He was in San Quentin on drug charges. And people thought he was dead. He was gone. And he reemerged in 1985. And the whole jazz public kind of went, wow, we thought you were dead. <laughs> you know, and he wasn't dead. He had been just in hibernation because he got busted on heroin charges. He fell victim to, he's very much influenced by Charlie Parker. He was too much influenced by Charlie Parker. But he had sort of a second career, starting from 1985 to last year, a couple years ago. Um, he, he has uh, several albums that uh, once he reemerged in the public that he played. Uh, and you'll notice he's playing very fast. It's a very virtuosic type of music. Again, you've heard no melody yet. It's been trumpet solo, now it's going to be saxophone solo. This is a quintessential example of bebop music. Bam, bam, boom. Kind of flurries of notes. he finishes his solo. They're actually playing on a 32 measure form, but it's going by so fast it doesn't take very long to get through 32 measures. That's the dropping bombs thing. Here comes the melody. 
melody. The melody is no simpler. This is the melody. Drummer go, middle section. Last part of the melody again. So of that particular example, uh, basically you were hearing 97%, or I think it was higher, was improvisation. Almost all of that example I played for you was improvised. The very last little bit, and where bebop gets its name is because most of the phrases sound like that. It's onomatopoeia, uh, if you know what that word means, bang, you know, bow wow, meow, you know, clickety clack. It's a word that tries to describe its sound. That's what something that's onomatopoetic is that. And so bebop, the writers started to say, you know, these phrases sound like they're going da 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 bebop, da 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 bebop, da 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 bebop, biddly da bebop, biddly da bebop. And almost all the bebop tunes have that kind of characteristic. They end with a high to low note or a low to high note that sounds like you're going bebop, you know, from bottom to top or top to bottom. The musicians hated it. They hated that term. They would call them beboppers or reboppers when they first started out. And it got shortened to bop, which was slightly hipper, but they still didn't really care for that. And a lot of musicians refused to call their music that, but it got labeled and it stuck. That's what the writers who were trying to define the music, they just called it bop, because or bebop, because that's what it sounds like. 